So this is a uh, continuation of uh, my lecture. So let me review very fast uh, what we discussed. I had an introduction uh, in which I talked about uh, the final state conjecture. And then I mentioned that uh, there are uh, the final state conjecture, which is uh, a, a general conjecture about the large time behavior of uh, general solutions of the Einstein equations in the asymptotically flat regime. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it contains many other, <coughs> it's a huge conjecture which contains many other uh, uh, <coughs> simplified cases, you could say, but each one of these cases are huge conjectures themselves. So rigidity uh, is the statement that uh, the only solutions of uh, stationary solutions of the Einstein equations in vacuum are the care family. Uh, and I talked a little bit about this. Stability is what we are talking about now, which is that if you make small perturbations of care, you stay close to care. Uh, <coughs> as a particular case, which is now understood, is <laughs> I talked about the stability of Minkowski space and uh, sort of the ideas behind. I'll mention more uh, as I go. And uh, then <coughs> today, I'll talk about the black hole stability. I started already. Uh, the conjecture is uh, this one, that uh, if you look at the picture of the Kerr solution, so this is a Kerr solution, you look at the exterior of a Kerr solution. This is a horizon, this is sky. You have a space-like hypersurface. And uh, <coughs> if you look at the induced metric on the space-like hypersurface, so you look at the initial data set corresponding to Kerr, make a small perturbation, the conjecture is that you are going to converge to another care solution. So it's another, which is very important, because the final states are going to be different from the original states. And of course, that by itself is a huge difficulty, uh, mathematical difficulty to find these final states. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, in fact, a few times, uh, if you look at if you look at the, so these are of course the Einstein equations in vacuum. GMA is a care metric. So we ha it's a care metric, so it depends on two parameters, M and A. And uh, if you start varying the parameters, you get solutions of the linearized equations. So linearized Einstein equations uh, and uh, DGM over DM uh, is a, uh, solution of the linearized equations equal, equal to zero on the right hand side, which is non-trivial. So, so in other words, you get uh, essentially a bound state for the linear equation. Uh, and the uh, same thing if you do the derivative with respect to A. Uh, so these are non-trivial solutions of the, uh, of the linearized equation corresponding to essentially zero eigenvalues. So uh, you expect this to create a lot of problems. Uh, in fact, you get even more problems because uh, b due to the diffeomorphism invariant, you can do variations relative to diffeomorphisms, and you get a, a huge set uh, of the kernel. So you, you find out that the kernel of this uh, linearized uh, equation, Einstein equation, has uh, this plus this. So in other words, uh, the full dimension of, uh, of the kernel is actually of the four times infinity plus two, okay? So it's a huge, huge thing. And that, of course, uh, makes life very difficult. All right, so uh, now, uh, I talked a little bit about geometric framework. Uh, and uh, so may, let me recall very fast. So first of all, uh, so this is something very general. <coughs> Einstein equations in vacuum, and not just Einstein equations in vacuum. Uh, you start with a, a null pair, so this is very important. Uh, because somehow it's a null pair that it, it this, uh, the null directions in general relativity are are fundamental. Uh, so you want a geometric description to reflect that fact. So you start with null pair. So this is a null vector. This is another null vector, and you normalize it so that uh, the, <coughs> the metric G is three four is minus two. Then you look at uh, horizontal structure induced by this. In other words, you look at the space perpendicular to three four. Uh, and uh, this uh, doesn't necessarily, it does not have to be integrable. Sometimes it is integrable, and that's very useful, but uh, in general it's not integrable, which creates 
additional difficulty, but very interesting uh, mathematical difficulties. Uh, and uh, you define a null frame then to consist of the null pair plus uh, an orthonormal basis of the space, right? Which again is, does not have to be integrable. So at every point you have a collection of, uh, of uh, vectors of this type, two null vectors, and then the ones which are orthogonal. Of course, this space uh, is obviously space-like. So, uh, and then you do, a, a, when you have the frame, <coughs> you look at the connection. So you define the connection. And as I mentioned last time, uh, you really have to decompose a connection into various components relative to the frame. And uh, you give them names. Uh, and uh, uh, if anybody wants, I can, I can repeat what, uh, what is the definition of this one. You do the same thing for the curvature. You get alpha, beta, rho, rho star, beta, bar, alpha, bar. So of course, for those who know the, the, Newman the Newman Penrose, uh, it's, uh, they are all real. so this is like psi 2, I guess. I, I don't know how, how, it depends on how you start. So this is like psi 2, psi 1, psi 0, these two, then psi, uh, or I don't know, you start from psi 0, then psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, plus 4, plus psi, uh, psi 5, exactly. Everything is real here. And everything is real here, right. I comp can comp it's complex for uh, Correct. So th this is, in a sense, more geometric, because I, I don't need to pick up a particular frame. So this is independent of the, so all these definitions are independent of this frame that I, I pick up here. But of course, I can also complexify. There, there is a simple relation between the between these various descriptions, and of course, it it, it, it helps when you talk about care. You actually, it helps to look at the rho plus i rho star. In fact, right? so even in our formalism, this is uh, okay. Then uh, you write down main equations. In in other words, you you write down the Cartan equations, which is uh, derivatives of gamma plus gamma times gamma gives you the curvature. So this is one system of equations at the level of uh, the gammas. And then you have Bianchi identities for R. All right, so these are the main equations are, are <laughs> the Cartan equation plus the Bianchi equations. And uh, uh, the, the other thing that uh, is important to mention, and I mentioned last time, is uh, uh, the <laughs> S-foliations. Of course, so these are foliations induced by E3, E4. Now, if this thing is not integrable, you cannot talk about foliations. But very often, uh, this, uh, uh, for example, in Schwarzschild or in Minkowski space, you can pick up the null frame so that this is actually integrable. It gives you two spheres, for example, topologically two spheres. And these are the S foliations. So uh, uh, an S foliation means that uh, at every point in space time, <coughs> the space time that you consider, you have, uh, for example, you, you have uh, null light cones going in this direction, another null cone going in this direction, and the intersection is a two-sphere, right? So let's say uh, this is u equal constant, this is u bar equal constant. <coughs> then when they intersect, you actually get a two-sphere, S of u, u bar, <coughs> and uh, of course you have an, uh, <coughs> a frame then at every point, you have a frame which is generated by, by the family of light cones. So you have a frame in, uh, yeah, on S, you have a frame which is we call E4, and the other one which you call E3. So at every point uh, on the sphere, you have such a frame. <laughs> and uh, so exfoliation plays a very important role in the stability of Minkowski space, as I mentioned last time. <coughs> All right, so this is a Kerr family again. Uh, so in boyer linkus coordinates, uh, so these are the coefficients of the Kerr solution. Obviously, uh, we discussed stationary axis symmetric and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, here, of course, I, I want to put in evidence that there exists, there exists this, uh, this null pair, E3, E4, which is defined in terms of uh, the uh, well li link with coordinates. And this is a, uh, called the principal null direction. So it's a principal direction because it has some remarkable properties which I, I will review again. Uh, anyway, here are uh, the basic quantities, again, in expressed now, uh, as we said, for example, the definition of chi AB is this one. You take uh, EA and EB, which are the ones perpendicular to E3, E4, 
and you take the derivative uh, in E4. Now, this quantity, which has a, a geometric significance, is symmetric if, uh, if the span is integrable, but otherwise it's not. So, as, otherwise, uh, so if, for example, in Kerr, if you take, so Kerr is a, an obvious example, if you take E3, 4 to be this uh, null pair that I had earlier, uh, then, uh, then uh, this is not integrable in this case, so the space is not integrable, and therefore these quantities are not symmetric, and you get uh, a lot of components. And again, it's very important to keep track of the components because they have different behavior. The curvature components are defined very easily. Alpha has two E4s, beta has uh, two E4s and one E3, and rho has uh, two E4, two E3, and so on and so forth by symmetry if you interchange E3 and E4. Uh, the b basic equation, again, are, are the null structure equations which relay the gammas, derivative of gammas, to the curvature. And uh, there are some Kodatsi type equations which are uh, derivative of gamma is equal to curvature plus derivative of gamma plus gamma times gamma. So th this is just a very sort of very simplistic description of what the equations look like. And then the null Bianchi equations, which are equations uh, for components of the curvature, which formally look like this, a derivative in the E4 direction. So this is the E4 direction, this is the E3 direction. Derivative in E4 direction is derivative of R plus gamma times R and so on and so forth. So uh, the way to think about these equations, the way we think about both instability of Minkowski space and uh, stability of uh, of black holes is that uh, the E4 directions can be viewed as, uh, as uh, equations along, along uh, geodesics, null geodesics, or null curves, if, it, if they are not exactly geodesics. Uh, and uh, somehow, if you know already R, so if you have information about curvature, you can somehow hope to integrate this transport equation. So this, uh, th this can be viewed as transport equation. Of course, they are more complicated because they could be derivative. This is a derivative on the right hand side. Anyway, but sort of very roughly, one can think of it as transport equations. This one can think about it as some kind of elliptic equations on, on, on the uh, leaves of the foliation, provided that the foliation is integrable. And, uh, and then uh, these equations, one has to really understand them in a very different way. So these are much more complicated. This is, these are the equations uh, where the sort of the hyperbolic nature of the Einstein equation uh, is, has to be taken into account. And uh, in the stability of Minkowski space, uh, we said that, uh, that somehow these type of equations have to be understood uh, from the point of view of doing en ge energy estimates, generalized energy estimates, uh, using the symmetries of Minkowski space or close to Minkowski space in order to derive decay estimates and so on. So this is sort of the main part, in fact, of any kind of construction of solutions of the Einstein equations. All right, so now uh, the crucial fact in CARE is that relative to a principal null direction, to the principal null direction, as was E3 and E4, then, uh, then uh, all components of the curvature are zero with the exception of rho and rho star, which are given simply by this very nice expression. Uh, in, uh, and then uh, if you look at the Ricci coefficients, again, a lot of, some of the Ricci coefficients are zero, but not all. There are still lots of components which are non-zero in, in CAD. Uh, in Schwarzschild, if you are in Schwarzschild, in addition, you get that the, the C3-4 is integrable. So that's very nice because now you can do a little bit of Hodge theory on two surfaces, which is, uh, plays a fundamental role in stability of Minkowski space. And, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, you have uh, uh, also that rho star, which is this one, is equal to zero. So in Schwarzschild, you just get one component of the curvature, which is this rho, and which is 2m over r cube. So minus 2m over r cube. So it's also very easy to calculate. Uh, and uh, the, the only, uh, and in addition, you get other components which are zero. So as a components of, of the Ricci coefficients, which are zero in Schwarzschild. So these are eta, eta bar, and theta. In fact, the only non-vanishing components of gamma in Schwarzschild are trace chi, trace chi bar, omega, and omega bar. So these are co connection coefficients, which, 
if you don't remember, it doesn't matter. The important thing is, is to, to note that, uh, that uh, many, if you use a principal null frame, many, many things really vanish. So that's why principal null frames are so important. In Minkowski space, so once again, you go from Kerr, Schwarzschild, and you get even more, more of a simplification in Minkowski space. In ad addition, you get that all components of the curvature are zero. You get that these two components of the Ricci coefficients are zero. So in fact, the only non-trivial components are trace k and trace k bar, which have very simple geometric meaning. Right? So that's, that's the situation in Schwarzschild. Is there not a choice in Kerr of uh, different E3 and 4 where they are integrable, the orthogonal thing? Because the Boyer coordinates have a sphere, so I can take. Yeah, sure, but but uh, the so-called Kinos layer tetrahedron. Well, because you want the symmetry here. In order to still get integrability, you mean? But you you lose yeah. some, you lose the diagonalization. Yes, you lose something. You lose and get something else. Yeah, okay. sure. So you can always there is always a trade-off that you might want to use. Yes, that's true. Uh, but still, I believe that, <coughs> that this, these are fundamental. I mean, maybe you want to construct, maybe you want to have this principal null frame or something close to the principal null frame, and from it, you construct the, the other one, which is integrable, right? But I don't there know. There is a null frame, no, which is integrable. Yeah, 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 yeah no, certainly. The so principle here, what, how do you define principle null frame? Uh, principle I I is in, in terms of of course, in care, right? So it's principal in, in care, in the sense that the curvature diagonalizes with the exception of rho and rho star, right? So all components of the curvature are zero except rho and rho star. Okay, I thought they were other friends, which were dissymmetric between past and future, but integrable. But uh, okay, maybe I forgot. Well, I mean, I we, we can talk. All right. So uh, okay. So here, here is now uh, the point of uh, perturbations. So. I want to perturb, of course, care. So in a simplest possible approximation, I want to think about having a solution of the Einstein equations where uh, there exists some frame, right, which is close to the principal null frame of care, say, uh, and, uh, and such that all components which are, which are uh, zero in care relative to the corresponding frame are now of epsilon. Right? So I have a O of epsilon perturbation of E3, 4 of care, and then therefore uh, this is an O of epsilon uh, perturbation of these various components of, of curvature and Ricci coefficients. So this is a definition. So it's a very simple definition. It's very naive, of course, but that's the simplest I can, I can think of, of what you mean by an O of epsilon perturbation of the space time. Right? Now, uh, the problem is, of course, uh, <coughs> you, you don't know which frame you are talking about. In fact, there are infinitely many frames that you can use. So if I have one frame which is good, for which I have this, I can make a frame transformation. I can make a, a general frame transformation which takes a, takes a null frame into another null frame. So in, other, in, in other words, I go from E3, 4 to E3 prime, E4 prime. They change like this. Ea prime changes like this. And then uh, these ones will also change and I get another O of epsilon. So in other words, there are infinitely many possibilities of, course of, of having frames like this. So which one do I choose? And of course, as I mentioned last time, the gauge condition, uh, if I don't have a correct gauge condition, I have no chance to prove stability of the care solution. So the, the gauges are fundamental. So finding the correct gauge is really uh, at the heart of the problem. Okay, so now the remarkable fact about this, if you, if you look at the, the way these things transform, right? So, so I, I want to calculate how every component transforms relative to these uh, frame transformations. I find uh, something remarkable. I find that alpha and alpha bar are all of epsilon square invariant. In other words, if I change, if I, if I start with uh, a frame, I, I, I calculate alpha and alpha bar in that frame, and I make this change, I observe that the difference between alpha prime and alpha is all of epsilon square, the same thing with alpha bar. Right? So these are all of epsilon square invariant. So in a certain sense, this do not depend on the choice I make. So that, that's very uh, extremely important, as we shall see. By the way, at which stage do you construct a full coordinate system? Because, I mean, the frame is not a, a solution at the end. Everything has to yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you also construct, right. You, uh, you do it at the end? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, essentially at the end. Well, 
you have to do everything at once in a sense. I mean, you cannot, yeah, non-linear equations, you, everything has to. So, okay, so in any case, uh, the, uh, the, the other observation is that for perturbation of Minkowski space, all curvature components are of epsilon square invariant. In other words, if, if I, of course, in perturbation of Minkowski space, also I have rho and rho star are also of epsilon. And uh, if I do this kind of transformations, it's very easy to see that all components of curvature of epsilon square invariant. And this is uh, one major simplification of the stability of Minkowski space. All right. And, and I talked a little bit about it last time. So last time I talked about stability of Minkowski space. I mentioned, so let, let me maybe mention uh, a, a few things about stability of Minkowski space. So the, 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 the fundamental point on the stability of Minkowski space is that uh, exactly because the curvature somehow is almost invariant, it's all epsilon square invariant relative to perturbations, I can, I can look at the Bianchi identities, right? So, so we have, uh, say, dr and, and uh, this dr equal to zero. So uh, remember that I, I said that this kind of pair, the Bianchi identity pairs, uh, can be viewed as some kind of Maxwell equation. Maxwell equation. There was also a, a, an energy type momentum tensor which, uh, which has four indices and such that the divergence of it is equal to zero. And then therefore you can construct energy norms uh, and uh, analyze this equation is like a, a Maxwell system, use the symmetries of Minkowski space, use in fact approximate symmetries because, because obviously perturbations don't have symmetries anymore, but they have approximate symmetries. And uh, that's how you, you treat the hyperbolic character of the Einstein equations in, in Minkowski space. Once, once I understand this, then uh, I have, of course, th this has to be done together with something else, which is uh, a construction of a frame and you construct by using a time function t and uh, an optical function u. So in other words, uh, a time function which is maximal. So th this is a maximal time function. And u verifies the iconal equation. So in fact, actually, uh, we solve the Einstein equation. So this is important. You solve the Einstein equation together with this uh, u. So g alpha beta d alpha u d beta u is equal to zero. So you really have to think that you solve both. And of course, you also solve for t uh, in, the st in the original proof of the stability of Minkowski space. Uh, so in other words, you, you have to contract this uh, together. And, uh, and then once you, have, once you have these two functions, which they give you a, a foliation, because light cones, of course, they intersect with time. So u equal constant intersects with t equal constant in a two surface. And then I can use this two surface and, and u and, and t in order to construct a null frame, which is perpendicular to, uh, to the sections. Uh, this would be the section STU. And then you, d you define the, the uh, connection coefficients from it. And then, very importantly, you construct vector fields. You construct vector fields which are uh, uh, which are built based on uh, uh, on the frame, and uh, you use these vector fields, in fact, to take lead derivatives of curvature here. So you commute you commute the vector fields with this equal to well, you'll get now error terms, and so on and so forth, right? So that's that's more or less what I explained last time. So the 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 idea. The very important idea behind all this, which I explained last time, is that you can get decay not by using fundamental solution, which is a very complicated thing, and uh, you, 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 you run into lots of difficulty if you try to use it, but, uh, but rather uh, this vector field method, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention more later. So it's a robust method. Uh, which uh, allows you to get derived decay and at the same time to derive uh, also energy estimates and so on and so forth. Okay, so in any case, uh, the difference between Kerr stability and uh, stability of Minkowski space. So some null curvature components for rho star are non-trivial, and as a consequence, you cannot use this Bianchi system anymore. So the Bianchi system will fail because there will be bound states for it. 
So if you try to solve this, you run immediately into trouble. Okay, so, so th this kind of methodology, unfortunately, doesn't work. Uh, so uh, uh, all other null components of the curvature tensor are sensitive to frame transformations. So this is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, alpha, alpha bar are invariant, but unlike Minkowski space where everything is, all curvature components are invariant up to epsilon, o of epsilon squared. This is not the case here. Uh, principle and direction are not integrable, but that's another uh, huge difficulty, which you, and then you have to track dynamically the parameters uh, of the final care and the correct gauge condition. And this, 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 are, this is, of course, the most difficult part. It, uh, because you don't know, if you, if, you don't, if you are not in the correct center of mass frame, you don't have decay, and therefore you cannot conclude anything about the nonlinear equations. So you cannot close. So uh, finding the correct center of mass frame and finding the, the, the way to track down the, the final parameters is uh, one of the main things in, uh, main difficulties in, in primitive uh, stability, which of course you don't have in Minkowski space. And then finally, uh, this is another uh, thing, which is that even if you look at very simple equations, like w the wave equation in care, for a scalar phi. Let's just look at this, the simplest possible equation, which you can think of it as some kind of simplified linearization. I mean, it, 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 it's much simpler, of course, than the full linear system uh, satisfied by the linearized Einstein equations. But you can start looking at this, and th this already has lots of difficulties, as uh, I should discuss. All right, so these are, these, are, these are the things that you have to worry about if you want to prove the stability of black holes. Right. So, are there any questions? All right, so, uh, so let me continue then. Okay, so, <coughs> so there, there have been a lot of progress, and, uh, and uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to talk about uh, the most important steps, and of course, uh, I mean, obviously, I will not be able to review absolutely everything that has been done, but in my view, the most important uh, uh, conceptual contributions to the understanding of, of the stability problem uh, starts with Tukolsky, uh which uh, proved in 1973, again based on the work of many other people from before, which I'm not going to I'm not, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but uh, in any case, he showed that these extreme curvature components, alpha, alpha bar, which are all epsilon square invariants, so they are already uh, more interesting than anything else, they verify, again up to all epsilon square error terms, decoupled linear wave equations. Right? So in other words, you, you, uh, in, in linear theory, you get that this alpha, alpha bar verify some equations. Of course, the equations are not so simple because the, you, could have, uh, you could have terms of first order and you could have terms of second order when you have derivatives multiplied by something. Okay, so these are the equations and of course the same, something similar happens for alpha bar. So, but in any case, they are not coupled with the other components of the curvature and they are not coupled with the other components of the Ricci coefficients and so in that sense, these are uh, quite remarkable. And, uh, it turns out it's not so difficult to, to show that. It has something to do with these invariance properties of uh, alpha, alpha bar. Uh, but uh, the unfortunate thing about this alpha, alpha bar is that the equations are non-conservative. You cannot find a good conservation law here. They are not derivable from a Lagrangian. And therefore, uh, from the point, I mean, they, they are useful, for example, in terms of showing that there are no exponentially growing modes. So, uh, so just you can analyze this and, and show that there are exponentially growing modes, but this by itself, as we discussed many times, this is far from being uh, able to do anything uh, in terms of nonlinear equations. So, but in any case, this has led to uh, Whiting's result of 1989, where you show that the Tukolsky linearized equations have no exponentially growing modes. Some of it has been done by Tukolsky for a few modes. Uh, but Whiting was able to do this for all modes, okay, right? I think this was a uh, sort of main contribution of Whiting. And then uh, later was uh, 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 Jakob Schlappenthal-Rotman in 2014, 
where he actually uh, proved a slightly stronger result than, uh, than Whiting, show uh, some kind of quantitative mode stability for this equation. This, uh, in fact, was then used, this result was then used in uh, this remarkable work of Dafermos Ronianski Rodman in 2015, which uh, uh, used uh, a new vector field method, I'll, I'll mention in a second, and Jacob's result here to deduce quantitative decay estimates for this. So what I mean by quantitative decay, remember that I, I, I said many, many times, is not enough to just show, show that these equations are well behaved. You have to actually derive quantitative decay, which you can later hope to use uh, in order to close the nonlinear terms, because uh, you have to control the nonlinear terms. For that one, you need decay. Anyway, so this, uh, this, uh, uh, this type of results uh, for this, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more in a, in a second, so maybe I'll... I'll continue right now. And by the, the fact that there are transformations between the Tchaikovsky equation and the and the Zeri, I mean the Rajay Wheeler. Yes, I'll, I'll mention it in a second. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, this this I'll mention. All right, so this is a uh, this is a I I'll, I'll call it the first uh, sort of important conceptual breakthrough. Uh, another uh, important breakthrough is uh, the classical vector field method. So this this is so while well, the first one is due to uh, physicist, this one is due to mathematicians. Uh, classical vector field method is a non-perturbative method based on using the continuous symmetries of Minkowski and adapted higher order energy estimates, which you build by using these symmetries to derive robust uniform decay and peeling. So th this is what I discussed last time, that uh, if I have, say, in the simplest case, <coughs> just <coughs> the wave, <coughs> wave equation in Minkowski space, of course, you could, you could derive uh, pr the, proper, the decay properties of, of the solution using the fundamental solution, but that is very hard to reproduce if you have perturbation of the metric here. Uh, in exchange, the vector field method is a, a method where you commute the ambition of I with, with a, a class of vector fields, which corresponds to the symmetry of Minkowski space, uh, do energy estimates, and then from the energy estimates you get the decay. Okay? So, so this is sort of a robust way to get decay without doing uh, expansions or anything of that sort. All right, so that's, uh, and that led also to peeling. So in other words, you don't just get the decay estimates, you also get the uh, various uh, derivatives of the solution of the wave equation has different decay properties. And then, <coughs> and this method also can be generalized to the Maxwell equation and more complicated system of equations where you get the peeling corresponding to that. Again, without doing any, without using the fundamental solution in any way. Uh, you're just using the, 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 the symmetries of Minkowski space. And uh, th then there was another uh, important thing connection with, uh, in connection with the classical vector field method, which is a null condition, which is a, a structural gauge dependent condition on the quadratic part of a nonlinear system of wave equations, which ensures global regularity. So you, you identify a certain structure of the quadratic part. It suffices to look at the quadratic terms in the nonlinearity. And uh, you can immediately see, it's very easy to see whether the null condition is verified or not in that system of coordinates. But uh, in general, in general I, I, and I mentioned last time, uh, if you have more complicated system, this very much depends, this null condition depends on the gauge choices you make. So in, in some gauge, you can have a null condition, in another gauge, you may not. Right? So this is a gauge dependent thing. Uh, then there is a non-linear stability of Minkowski space, which is based on these ideas. Uh, which use, so uses generalized energy estimates, approximate symmetries, and uh, this allows you to get decay estimates for the curvature tensor. And once you get decay estimates for the curvature tensor, you, you also get it for the gammas by using the, the Cartan equation. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's roughly uh, uh, the classical vector field method uh, in a nutshell. Uh, okay, okay, here you use the fact that there are killing vectors of the... Minkowski, of Minkowski space. Can't you use the fact that there is a killing tensor for okay. curve? For curve? It, well, people are starting to use these sort of things, but um, it's, not yet, uh, it's not yet clear how far you can go. Yes, absolutely, but uh, th this has been used. So Blue and Anderson have used these sort of things. All right, so now, uh, 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 so this is uh, now a new vector field method. So when you talk about, when you talk about uh, black holes, 
the situation is more complicated because you don't have enough symmetries. So the, the symmetries of the chaos solutions are much fewer than the symmetries of Minkowski space. So the same sort of things, you can, you can still use the symmetries, but that's not enough. You have to use something else. And that's sort of the, what the new vector field method is. Again, this was developed by mathematicians in the last uh, 15, 16, 17 years. Uh, and uh, it's based uh, <coughs> on, so le let me try to explain a little bit because I think it's very interesting. So uh, let's look at a picture of a black hole, right? So this is exterior of the black hole. This is the horizon. This is cry. I'm looking uh, uh, at uh, the region maybe slightly inside the horizon, I mean inside the black hole, which is uh, R equal R H. So le let's say that this is a, uh, for, for simplicity, it's, it's Schwarzschild. So I'm in Schwarzschild. This is uh, R equal R H is R equal to M. So this is a horizon R equal to 2M. Then th there is this other thing here, R equal R star, which is R equal 3M. Right, so where I, I, as I mentioned earlier, this corresponds to null geodesics which stay here forever in the middle. And then there is a scry and so on and so forth. So if you look at the, uh, if you look at just, <coughs> suppose you want to analyze just the wave equation, but in Schwarzschild, right, equal to zero. J just for the simplest possible equ linear equations that you want. Uh, and uh, uh, you realize that you have a lot of uh, new difficulties that you didn't have in Minkowski space. The simplest is a difficulty exactly along the horizon, which is due to the fact that uh, on the horizon, the vector field dt, let's call it capital T, is, uh, becomes null. Right? So th if you look at the, the energies associated to this, the energy is always constructed based on, on, on this vector field, on the d over dt, if you look at the corresponding energy, you get a degeneracy. So you get a degeneracy at the horizon. Right? Right, so then you have to do something. So uh, the other thing that you have is this trap null geodesic. This trap null geodesic leads to a huge difficulty, uh, which uh, uh, it's natural because you expect in, in geometric optics, you expect that there has to be something wrong here. And in fact, there are, if you look at the energy estimate that, that uh, you, you want to do here, you'll see that there will be a degeneracy here, along, exactly along R equals 3M. And then, of course, there are all the issues at infinity. But this, in this part, you can, uh, you can argue as in Mikowski space. So the, the new methodology that uh, people have discovered is that somehow uh, it, it, it pays to still look at vector fields, so it, it, it's still based on vector fields, you don't, you don't use a fundamental solution, still based on vector fields, but you construct a new class of vector fields which are not necessarily uh, uh, causal. Uh, so for example, you can find a good vector field which takes into account uh, the region near the horizon, this is uh, called the redshift type vector fields, which were discovered by Fermos Rodnianski, I mean, they've been used by Fermos Rodnianski, uh, then there is a region here at R equal R star, which is really the, the most difficult because of this degeneracy. So this has been uh, taken into account by lots of people in the last 15, 16 years and has led to, uh, to, uh, lot, to methods in which, uh, excuse me, so the, there will be a method based, based on so-called the Moravitz vector field. So these are global global estimates for solution of the wave equation, uh, which degenerate here and degenerate here. And because of this, you have to combine this type of uh, vector fields. You have to combine it with vector fields which are good here in this region and vector fields which are good here in this region. And this is sort of a, a, a much more, uh, much more uh, engineering type of uh, approach than, in, in, than the old vector field method, which was more global. Here, every region, in every region you find something that works, and then you put them together somehow. And uh, you always have to have something which is global. Like in this case, it's a Moravec estimate. But again, the Moravec estimate may degenerate here and here, and uh, therefore uh, you have to combine it to something in this region and something in this region. So again, as I said, this region is more like in the stability of Minkowski, like in, in the case of Minkowski space. So anyway, so this was sort of a design type of uh, vector fields, uh, which uh, led to the ability to prove results for the wave equation in Schwarzschild. But uh, if you have care, it's even more complicated. 
So if instead of Schwarzschild you have Kerr, it's even more complicated because near, near this uh, region, near the horizon, there is a, a, in fact, a, 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 an entire region which is called the Ergo region, which I, I mentioned a few times, in which this becomes actually space-like. <coughs> and that leads to a, a, many more analytical difficulties which have been resolved, in particular, they have been resolved in, the, in this, uh, this uh, result that I mentioned here. Okay, so that's a, that's a situation. The new method had emerged in these last 15 years in connection with the study of boundedness and decay for this type of equation. There were many partial results, starting with uh, Soffer and Blue in 2003. So this is already 15 years. And then many, many others. Uh, but uh, the final result was proved by the Fermo, Rodnianski, Schlapp, and Rotman, and uh, uh, which deals with the full range A less than M in CAR. All right, so now, uh, third breakthrough, important breakthrough in, in our understanding today, is the result. So this is what you mentioned the result uh, of Chandra Sekar, that there exists a transformation which takes this alpha, which verifies a Tolkolsky equation, which is non-conservative. It takes it into uh, a, a tensor, a new tensor P, which can be calculated from this. In fact, it involves two derivatives of alpha. You, you need two derivatives of alpha to get P. And this P verifies uh, a regi wooler type of equation. In other words, it's, it's wave equation at P plus a potential <coughs> times P is equal to 0. All right. So this is uh, an observation which was already made by Chanda Sekar, but uh, the full use of, of this transformation uh, in, in terms of actually getting, getting real estimates is due to the Fermos, Holzeg, and Rodniansky in uh, 2016, uh, where they get a physical expression for this equation, uh, starting, I mean, the, the equation the, the Chandra second transformation was based on mods, but anyway, this is maybe not so important. The more important thing is that they used the equation, they used their methodology, the methodology that has been, that has been, uh, uh, that has emerged in these last 15 years that I mentioned earlier, in order to analyze the decay rates for P for this equation, right? So they get uniform decay rates for this. Uh, and then once you have, so once you have a full understanding of P, you can go back, you can revert and go back to alpha and get uh, estimates for alpha. And of course also estimates for alpha bar because there is something similar from alpha bar to P. Anyway, so, uh, uh, and then this is used as a, a first step to prove the linear stability of Schwarzschild, which I mentioned in a second. Okay, then recently there have been even uh, more interesting developments, which is that, uh, uh, something similar can be done to control the Tokolsky equation even in care if A is sufficiently small. So for sufficiently small, there is now a way of uh, uh, complementing this uh, observation of, of uh, Chanda Sekar with something slightly more complicated, but which still allows you to analyze and to get the decay estimates for this type of equation where you are already, uh, sorry, for, for uh, the, in other words, you, you start with alpha Tokolsky equation and uh, you get a, a, a system, you get something more complicated, for which you can analyze, and then you can go back and get estimates for alpha. Okay? So this can be done now for care for small a, which is uh, clearly very important. By the way, contrary to Rodian's key, Tchaikovsky is written with a Y at the end. Ah, OK, sorry. <laughs> OK, good. I will change. All right, so, uh, so these are, again, new results of the Fermos, Holzeger, and Jansky, uh, and uh, a student of Anderson in last year uh, called Ma. Okay, so now, uh, linear stability of Schwarzschild. So this is, uh, <coughs> once you, once you uh, understand this type of transformations, uh, you can show that the Schwarzschild care uh, so in other words, zero when a is equal to zero. So Schwarzschild space is linearly, quantitatively in the sense, quantitatively in the sense that you get real decay estimates, uniform decay estimates, which is uh, immensely important if you want to do non-linear equation, non-linear theory. Uh, once we mod out the unstable modes related to this, uh, 
uh, two parameters family of nearby stationary solution. This is what I mentioned at the beginning, and linearized gauge transformations. Right? So, uh, so once you so in linear theory, of course, it's much easier to do this. Uh, and uh, but once you do that, you can show that everything uh, decays appropriately. You get bounds and decay for all the quantities. Okay, so uh, this is done by using the Chandrasekhar transformation. You derive uh, from it, you get an equation which I, I mentioned you can analyze, uh, and then from it you get alpha alpha bar. And then once you have this, then you see, so this doesn't, these are gauge independent in some sense, alpha alpha bar. At least in linear theory, they are completely gauge independent. But uh, not the other quantities. So the other, the other curvature quantities are not. And also, of course, the Ricci coefficients. So reconstruction means that you have to now find appropriate gauge conditions. So this, this is only going to work if you now impose gauge conditions. You find appropriate gauge conditions to derive bounds and decay for all other quantities of the linearized Einstein equations of Schwarzschild. So this, this is basically uh, what's done. All right, so now uh, there are some uh, additional results uh, based on different approaches by uh, by uh, Hoon, Keller, and Wang in 2017, and then based on wave coordinates in uh, Hoon, Johnson, uh, in 2018 by Hoon and Johnson. Okay, so summary of what we understand so far. We have tools to control in principle the main curvature quantity P. So remember P is obtained by going from alpha to P by, by sort of a second order operator. Right, so one, so this verifies a nice equation, but of course now, in nonlinear theory, so this Chandrasekhar transformation verifies a nice equation here with zero in linear theory, but in nonlinear theory, of course, there would be huge number of turns on the right hand side, which are very complicated, in fact. So, so, uh, but the, at least we know that they are going to be quadratic. So. They are quadratic in small quantities, uh, which vanish in, in Schwarzschild. So, okay. All right, so, uh, so with this, we have tools in principle to uh, control the invariant quantities alpha, alpha bar. Because, again, if I know P, I can go back to alpha, alpha bar. So what remains to be done? Find quantities that track dynamically the mass and angular momentum. Find an effective dynamical method to fix the gauge problem. Determine the decay properties of all important quantities. And close the estimates of the full nonlinear problem. So now what time is it? Uh, let's see, 11. Ah, OK, so I can, I can go on. All right, so, uh, so let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the nonlinear problem. So, OK, so uh, going from linear to nonlinear, So we understand something about linear stability of Schwarzschild. And now we, we, we want to go to nonlinear. And in the first approximation, you may also want to do first Schwarzschild because it's a little bit simpler. As we, as we have seen, Schwarzschild is much simpler. OK, so now the, the, the major difficulty, I mean, there are lots of difficulties, of course, to go from linear to nonlinear. But in particular, one of the unpleasant things about uh, doing nonlinear, uh, the nonlinear theory, nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild, is that if I start with initial data which are close to Schwarzschild, I'm not going to converge to Schwarzschild again. I'm going to go to the, the final state. Will also have a will also have a, a angular momentum, right? So. So the final state, AF and MF, e even if I start with 0M here, a perturbation of 0M, I will converge to, to a final state which has an angular momentum. And therefore, I cannot really study, it doesn't seem like I can study stability of Schwarzschild without understanding f the full stability of Kerr, at least for small a. And then Kerr is, has many other complications, and you know, you'd like to separate complications because Otherwise, you'll never be able to do anything if you try to do everything at once. So, uh, so we really want to separate uh, Schwarzschild still. So the question is, is there a way to impose conditions so that uh, the final set is still Schwarzschild? Okay. 
So it turns out that there is uh, a simple way to do that, which is uh, by imposing some symmetries on, on the solution. So uh, symmetries, uh, and that's what I want to talk now. Uh, so I, I want to assume th that my initial data have certain uh, symmetry. So in other words, I, I want to look at the restricted stability of Schwarzschild. And uh, let me re recall a little bit how you take into account symmetries if you are in uh, uh, general relativity, so for solutions of the Einstein equations. So let's assume that we have a space-time which verifies the vac vacuum equations, uh, but I want, to I, I, I want to assume also that there is a Keeling vector field Z. Okay, so Z will be a Keeling vector field, and I want it to correspond to a rotation, in fact. Right? So, so I assume that I have a rotational Keeling vector field. Then uh, there is a sort of a very general, uh, very general construction, uh, which uh, 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 is done by taking this G of ZZ, which you call X, and uh, for forming an Ernst, Ernst potential. Uh, so Ernst potential is a scalar uh, X plus I Y. Uh, y can also be defined very easily by, by but Y can be defined by taking derivative of T uh, and uh, and then uh, you, you actually take the Hodge dual and you multiply by t again, and that gives you, that will give you the, the y. Z here? Uh, t is z, yes, sorry, z. So z. OK, so, uh, and then uh, uh, once you have that, it's very easy to see that this combination, which is called the Ernst potential, verifies a wave equation. So you get x times the ambition of phi is d mu phi times d mu phi. And uh, moreover, uh, you, can also, you can also show that uh, the, uh, there is a, uh, the metric, the original metric can be reduced into a component h, which is now only two plus one dimensional, and this scalar, I mean this complex scalar phi. And that together they verify, they verify a system of wave equation, a system of equations like this. So Ricci of the reduced metric is expressed in terms of the phi, and the wave equation with respect to the metric H or phi verifies an equation like this. All right, so this is uh, the simplest uh, thing where you assume axial symmetry and you, you get a simplified system of equations. But the, this is not good enough because uh, in, in reality, I want to start with Schwarzschild. In the case of Schwarzschild, y will be 0. And uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, if you start with y equal to 0, you stay 0. Okay? So that's th what is called polarization. So axisymmetric polarized means that, uh, that I also assume that y is equal to 0. Okay? And then if you, start with, uh, if you start with this component 0 initially, it stays 0 for all time. That's easy to see. And therefore, uh, therefore uh, you ensure that you stay polarized for all times. Uh, and uh, in, in that case, actually, so in the case of polarization, the metric, the space-time metric takes this very simple form, which is uh, x times d phi squared plus uh, gab dxa dxb. In other words, uh, they, the, in coordinates t, r, theta, and phi. So uh, you see that uh, relative to the metric, thi this is completely uh, decoupled for the other components. And therefore, I can think about this as being my, my true metric now, which is only 2 plus 1 dimension. It's Lorentzian, and it's 2 plus 1 dimension. So it, there is some kind of uh, reduction to a lower dimensional situation. And uh, the equations for uh, the curvature of this metric, right? So I'm looking at R for this metric, so which is a reduced metric, uh, is coupled with phi through this simple equation, dA dB of phi times this. And the inversion of phi is uh, very phi z. So this is the kind of coupled system that you have to uh, satisfy. You also see that the scalar curvature of this metric is equal to 0 from this very simple fact. And, uh, and uh, this is what uh, 
I want to do. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, uh, you stay in Schwarzschild. So if I start, I start in Schwarzschild, where y is indeed equal to zero, and I stay in Schwarzschild. Okay? So this is a simplification which really allows me to talk about stability of Schwarzschild. It turns out that, uh, actually, as we shall see, it turns out that these equations are really not important. I mean, you, you might think that this is what I should use now, because I have, I have simplified equation. Uh, I have just a, a simple wave equation here. And then uh, uh, all the, 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 the metric G can be recovered from this equation, if I know phi. Of course, this system is coupled. But it turns out that actually it's, it's not very helpful. And everything that uh, I'm going to discuss now is done in general, more or less. And only you have to remember that at some point, and uh, in, in some situations, uh, I have to take into account polarization. So polarization is going to be used, but, but most of the time it's not used. Okay? So most of the time I have to use the same, the same kind of thing that I would have to do in any other stability of care, for example. All right, now, uh, okay, so this is, this is maybe, I state the result and maybe we can take a, a short break. So here is a result uh, that I have with uh, Jeremy Seftel, which is that uh, small uh, axial polarized perturbations, right? So axial polarized means in the sense of a given initial conditions of an exterior Schwarzschild metric have maximum future developments converging to another exterior Schwarzschild, which is given by this final mass m infinity, which is of course different from the one I started with. And this is a picture, I'll talk more about after the, after the break. This is a picture of the, the space we construct. Uh, so uh, you actually, we start with the initial conditions on two null hypersurfaces. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why we are allowed to do that after the, after the break. So you have to imagine that you have initial data here and here, and, uh, uh, and you construct the space-time all the way to scry. The scry is complete. From scry, you see the horizon. So once you, of course, the horizon you can only find out after you constructed the whole space-time because it has to come from this point at, uh, at infinity on scry. So you construct the, the horizon. Here you have, uh, let's say, something like an apparent horizon maybe. Uh, and then uh, in addition, uh, I, I have to construct this uh, uh, time-like surface T, which uh, has a certain role, which I'll, I'll mention next time. So that's basically that's basically uh, the Penrose diagram of the space-time we construct. And now I think it's a good time to take maybe three or four minutes break, and then I'll explain this result. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so this is uh, the statement. And <laughs> I'll try to describe more in details what's going on. So the geometric features of the, this construction is, first of all, uh, you have a, an optical function, uh, which is uh, u. So u, optical function, I, I recall, is a solution of the iconal equation. But of course, <laughs> whenever you talk about uh, Maybe, maybe I should erase things here because yeah, to me... don't know yet the solution, so being optical means what exactly? Yeah, so let me, let me explain. Uh, so... So, uh, so you have, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have to solve the Einstein equation together with uh, some, uh, sorry, g alpha beta, d alpha u, d beta u is equal to zero. <coughs> and in fact, in fact, uh, there will be two such functions, u bar also. Namely, uh, the way to think about it is that somehow u, you see, when I solve this equation, of course, I have to initialize it somewhere. 
this one we initialize it on, on the initial data, right? So because you have an initial data set, but this one has to be initialized also somewhere. And, uh, and uh, we initialize here at i plus. Now, in, in reality, you'll see that it's actually initialized uh, in physical space. But in a first approximation, you can think about it's being initialized here on i plus, on scry. And then uh, the level sets of u are at 45 degrees. And they go all the way where they meet this t. So t is some time-like time surface, which is not too far away from uh, r equal to 2m which is 2m0, which is the original uh, Schwarzschild, right? So, so we have, we can still talk about the original Schwarzschild. This is, of course, not, not the event horizon anymore of the space-time we construct, but it's an event horizon of the one we started with. So, uh, so t is somewhere uh, uh, to the right of the horizon. Can it be below 3m? Uh, yeah, and it will be below 3m, right. Yeah, we make sure that it, it, it is below 3m. Though it's not, that's not that important, but in any case, yeah, we, we certainly take it below 3m. And uh, uh, so again, u is initialized here, okay? And then from here, when I reach t, I, I start the u bar, which goes in this direction. Right? So of course, you, we cannot go all the way with u because uh, you will not be able to cover the entire region of interest. So uh, as a consequence, we just go to a t, which is this time-like surface, and then we move in this direction. So this will correspond to u bar. So optical function u bar in m int. So m int is whatever is to the left of t. m x is whatever is to the, to the right of, uh, of t. Right? So t is some kind of time-like surface which is used uh, in order to dist distinguish between a region where we have to go this way and the region where we go this way. OK, so that's, uh, uh, OK, so we have an outgoing geodesic foliation from here uh, and an incoming geodesic foliation from here. And we define null frames. Uh, you can define null frames here by based on this uh, null geodesics. And right, so you, you, you uh, if I have a light cone, I have the, the null geodesics, and uh, let's call it, uh, say, E4. And then I can define an affine parameter, which is E4 of S is equal to E4 of S is equal to 1. So E4 of S is equal to 1 will give you a foliation of uh, all these light cones. Uh, and therefore, we'll have a null frame here, and the same thing here. We'll have a null frame here, right? So th this is a way to define the gammas uh, in the exterior region, gamma in the interior region. Okay, so that's uh, uh, enough about this. Okay, now, in reality, and the, the data are characteristic Cauchy data. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, th this is something that I will explain in a second why we are allowed to do that. The reason is that I if I start with a space like hypersurface sigma zero. Uh, then uh, I know f from a result uh, with Niccolo that if I go sufficiently far uh, towards infinities, right? So this corresponds to I naught. If I if I go sufficiently far towards I naught, then uh, the data here becomes s sufficiently small, so I can construct a piece of space time all the way to the to an alcon. And therefore, this part uh, we can assume that is already understood. Right? And then this part here, from here, also it's sort of a finite region, where again I can, instead of construct, instead of looking here, or starting with the space I have a surface, I can look here. Right? So therefore, I can assume that my data is given on, on all uh, hypersurfaces. Okay, so, uh, so uh, the data again is, is, is here and here. And now, the, the important point now, is that the space-time is constructed by a bootstrap procedure, right? I, I don't know yet that I can reach infinity. So I have to keep enlarging my space-time until I reach infinity. And uh, so that's, this is done by a bootstrap. So somehow you have to think about the fact that at, at any given time, the space-time under consideration is only this space-time, right? So I'm only going up to finite C bar star and the finite C star, right? And uh, 
And, uh, but then I have, in addition, I have a space-like hypersurface, which is, uh, we call sigma star, which is this one. And uh, uh, the initialization, instead of being done here, because I have not yet reached the scry, I'm going to do it from here. In other words, I construct the U foliation this way and the U bar foliation this way. So the space-time is constructed like this. And then I, I'm going to enlarge the space-time. I'll, 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 I'll show that uh, if, I, if I reach a certain stage, in reality, because of my a priori estimates, I can go a little bit further. So this way, I go all the way to infinity. So the, the idea is by bootstrap. The idea of the bootstrap is that you make certain assumptions and then you show that actually you can do much better, and therefore there is no reason to stop here. You can go further. That's uh, that's how it works. I mean, that's how it works also in the stability of Minkowski space. Okay, so uh, right. So the key features of the construction is, first of all, the Hawking mass plays a fundamental role for defining the the final mass. So. This is a well-known concept in general relativity. You define it by using uh, trace chi and trace chi bar. So re remember that uh, we have all these quantities, chi, chi bar, uh, eta, zeta, eta bar, and so on and so forth. And uh, trace chi, trace chi bar are just simply the traces of chi and chi bar. Of course, we, we are now, the situation in which we are now is, is, is one in which uh, we have a foliation by two surfaces. So all these quantities can be easily defined. And, uh, and uh, then the Hawking mass is, is obtained by taking uh, this concept MH divided by R. So R, I should say, on any two surface, you define R to be uh, the area radius. So in other words, 4 pi R squared is equal to the area of uh, the corresponding two surface at that point, at that particular point. So at every point you have, you have also an R, and therefore this is defined uh, this way. So an integral, and of course, this is the integral on the corresponding surface. So I have a surface here. Take the corresponding surface. I take the integral. This defines the Hawking mass. By the way, uh, Yao is supposed to have defined uh, improved version of quasi-local <coughs> mass. Has it been useful? In mathematics, or not yet, or you think it is not useful? I don't think it's useful. Uh, I mean, I will explain to you why it's not useful. I, I don't think it's useful. But don't tell it to him, because you'll get very upset. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> OK, so let me say it again. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, somehow when you you have to tie you have to tie to real constructions otherwise it's too abstract too general so in that sense it's interesting but it, it's hard to imagine at this stage how it will be useful All right so in any case it's not useful here so uh, then uh, uh, if, so I mean infinity uh, you can then define once you you see once you go all the way to infinity to scry in other words you can define the final m to be just the limit of uh, mh so you you get you, you get an you get a, on any u you get an mh here and you take the limit in this direction as mm -hmm. as u goes to infinity and then you get the final mass so the final mass is what you get here uh, after you but of course after you have constructed the whole thing but but yeah. but this can be defined the, the beautiful thing about the hawking mass is that it can define it locally you can show that it has estimates you, 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 you can get very nice equations for it, mm -hmm. which are quadratic on the right hand side, so they are very robust. And uh, the limits, uh, the fact that the limit exists once you have constructed space, of course you have to construct the whole space time to do that, but once you construct the space time, you immediately identify the Hawking mass. So the Hawking mass, uh, sorry, the, the, the final mass, which is uh, this one by taking the limit. So again, you take the limit as r goes to infinity, and then you take the limit as u goes to infinity, you get the final mass. Okay, now here is uh, the, the most important part is, uh, sorry, uh, the most important part is how to construct uh, U, right? Because now I have to be more specific. Before I said they construct it from infinity, but in reality you construct it from c sigma star. So I have to make choices on sigma star to initialize U. Right? In fact, actually, I even have to construct sigma star, as it turns out, right? The, the space line hypersurface. 
and uh, I want to do it, okay, and, and this is uh, the concept that we introduce, that uh, this space-like boundary is foliated by what we call GCMS sphere. So these are generally covariant modulated spheres. Right? So I don't know if you like, if you don't like the name, please tell me, because we can still change. So generally covariant. modulated spheres. <laughs> Perverse spheres. <laughs> we can use. So modulation makes sense, right? Generic covariant makes sense, so the two together make sense. Okay. No, but so what, what does it mean? <laughs> so what does it mean? It, it means that you use a full degrees of freedom of the covariant group of uh, diffeomorphies mm -hmm. in order to fix spheres in, in which certain, uh, certain quantities, certain key quantities associated to, the, to these things pick up specific values, right? In fact, zero, for example. I, 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 I would like to make certain things equal to zero. And you, you know, it, the, the reason is very simple, because you want to go, you see, you, you, go, you go in this direction, right, uh, in order to construct, the, I mean, to, to get estimates for the Ricci coefficients everywhere in the space time, right? But, you know, if I, if I start badly here, there is no way I can derive anything. So I have to initialize, I have to find good initializations on sigma star or good initialization of scry in some sense, right? But, uh, 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 but you, now you have to be very specific. What are these good initialization? So this is what we call GCMS spheres. And let me, I'll say a few more words about this. Okay, so, so here, here is what this, what this is. So this requires more of an explanation. You could just call them, you know, nice spheres or good spheres. People use... Good spheres. Nice yeah, but... Uh, this is more impressive, I think. GCMS. No? Well, okay. We'll, we'll discuss it at lunch. But, uh, uh, okay, so, so you see, yeah, so you, 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 have, you, you, you have a two sphere and then the corresponding light cone that starts from it, right? And uh, uh, I want to, I want to arrange these things so certain key quantities are zero. So for example, on any two surface, two surface, uh, there are certain oper operators which are called, ho which are ho Hodge operators, so Hodge operators, which are elliptic, elliptic operators. Which are naturally, which come naturally in the equations. So, in the if you write down the actual equations in terms of, uh, by the way, this is uh, you, you don't quite see it in the Penrose, in the Newman Penrose. I mean, it's 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 much better to use a geometric approach to see the the, the character of this equation. But anyway, you can see it in any, in the end, you can see it everywhere. They have their edge operators, yeah, which are yeah. covariant things on the two spheres. Right, but unless 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 they are integrable. Unless the spheres are integral, you, they are not, you're not going to be able to use them. Uh, he, but here you are integral. Yeah, here you are integral. So these are two spheres are integral. Okay, anyway, so the, the operators are, are, are defined like this. So there is a d1, d2, d1 star, and d2 star. So d1, d1 takes a, a, a one form, so it takes one forms into scalars. And D2 takes uh, two forms, well, symmetric, sorry, symmetric traceless. Because this is what comes up in, uh, when you write down the Einstein equations, uh, in the new one, of formula is more so if you want. Uh, if you write down the equations, you, you, you get symmetric traceless two tensors. And D2, so D2 will take, say, a tensor like this, psi AB, uh, which is symmetric traceless, and, and takes covariant derivative DB. Okay, so psi goes into this, right? So it, it takes, in other words, a two, two tensor into one tensor, right? So this is one, one forms. The, the one forms are not transverse. They do not satisfy divergence equals zero. They are just one forms. 
Uh, yeah, the, ju just one form, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, this is precisely what the <laughs> head uh, Yeah, doing. right. It, it's just that they are not integrable, so they, you cannot use it. You cannot use it as elliptic system because they are not integrable, right? Usually, I mean, in, in, in situations... Case, in, the, in, our in, our, in our case, yeah. So, it, in other words, what, what you are saying is that I could use those definitions. I could use, so they, are co they correspond exactly to those operators. Yeah, this I agree, yeah, absolutely. This I agree, yeah, right. It's just that the, the way we do it, uh, have a more geometric description. But anyway, this is kind of irrelevant. So once, uh, once you have D1, D2, you can take the, the, the duals, D1 star and D2 star. Right, so these are, th they will go from uh, scalars to one form. So D1 star goes to scalar to one form and D2 star go to, uh, from one form to, to two forms, right? Okay, so the, the operator D1, D2, D1 star, D2 star. So this, you can say that they are coercive on spheres. So coercive. And uh, these are not. So these have the kernel, non-trivial kernels. Kernels, right? Right, when the, th this plays a very important role in uh, this analysis. Okay, so anyway, what we want is that you take, the, you take trace chi on this sphere, right? So, so I, I have on the sphere, I take this trace chi S, right, which corresponds to the trace chi of this, and, uh, and take uh, uh, D1 star of it, and then D2 star of it. Okay, so, uh, so I can take, for example, D2 star of trace chi bar is equal to zero. I can take D1 star of trace chi equal to zero. And then I can take uh, also D2 star, D1 star of uh, that mu. Again, mu depends on S. So it's equal to zero. So what is mu? Mu is a quantity uh, which I'm not going to write down because I, I don't think there's any point. But it's 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 the ma it's sort of the mass aspect function. I, I'm sure that you you know what it is. Right? So it's a mass aspect function which is defined uh, using. So it, it's a combination of uh, rho. Uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so and, and some connection coefficients, but let me not let me not be very precise here. But I in any way, it's, uh, it's something at the level of the curvature. Okay, so in, in the only thing that you you need to uh, I, I can't quite explain why you take these ones, but it's extremely important to make some conditions. And you see, you take essentially something which is at the level of three. You have three three such con such conditions, which corresponds to the number of degrees of freedom of the transformations that I wrote down before, which goes from one frame to another frame, right? So again, I mean, this has to do with this, this fact that a priori, no frame, I don't have any way of choosing a particular frame. And it's right here that you make a, a choice. You, you make the choice by using the frame transformations. Uh, you, you, you make the choice in such, such a way that those, these three things are satisfied. This leads to a huge Hodge system should involve uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, it's a very coupled system, uh, w which will be a system for f, f bar, and lambda. So in other words, let me call it like this. You'll get some equation like this, d of f, f bar, and lambda. And uh, you show that it's coercive. The most important thing is to show that it's coercive. To show that it's coercive, you also have to take into account also something about the, the, these uh, kernels, because the kernels of d1 star and d2 star are non-trivial. So you have to really mod out the kernels and so on. So there is a lot of work that needs to be fixed. But the idea is that you use the full, you use a full number of degrees of freedom of your uh, gauge transformations, local gauge transformations, in order to construct such spheres. But at the end, the quantities here are scalars, trace of so Yeah, but... So are these scalars at the end constant, I mean uniform on your sphere or not? They have a variation such? Yeah, so for example, the, uh, trace chi s 
uh, it will be in fact two over R s. I didn't write it down, but yes, uh, there is also. Constant. So yeah, so this this one is constant, but of course the other one can have a kernel, right? So so okay. they they. But within the kernel, we will the, 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 the kernel, they are constant. They are fixed, but but in order to fix them completely, you need you need so something sure. else, which I didn't. But I didn't put. Yes, yeah. So they are totally yeah. They are completely unique. They are uniquely defined in the end, right? Everything will be uniquely defined in the end for for any of such. Uh, okay. So uh, so the the and then of course you you have to construct you have to show that such things exist because. See the, the the way the the way okay so let me say something about the bootstrap so the the way the bootstrap works actually me, le, let's look at the picture the way the bootstrap works uh, is that uh, you you assume that you start with initial data you go you prove use local existence so you can always go a little bit. And then you keep going until you reach a maximum. You cannot go any further, right? You, you, in principle, at some point you might stop because there are singularities and so on and so forth. I, if you have instabilities, you cannot go forever. So you assume that you stop somewhere, right? And, uh, but then uh, on the sigma star where I stop, I, I redesign, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, sorry, I, I I assume that uh, the space-time is such that on sigma star I have this GCMS, so I have this condition satisfied uh, on uh, on sigma star, and as a consequence, I can get very good estimates. And this is of course a, a, a huge long step. I can get a, a, a good estimates for all the connection coefficients and all the curvature in this region. And then uh, because uh, th these estimates are good enough, I can extend the space-time a little bit, so I can go slightly further. I can use the U foliation to go a little bit further and a little bit further in this direction and a little bit further in this direction. So in other words, I construct a slightly bigger space-time. But of course, as I construct this slightly bigger space-time, it's not at all clear that the new boundary sigma star verifies these GCMS conditions, right? Because uh, I, I do an extension coming from here. There's no reason why this should be satisfied. So what I have to do in this, in this region that I have constructed where I have extended the previous spacetime, I have to show that uh, there exists uh, a, sigma, a new sigma star, which consists of these GCMS conditions. So that's where you have to actually do most of the work to show that, uh, that, uh, that these things can be found. Right? Okay, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but for the moment, uh, this is uh, maybe the most important, I mean, clearly the most important part of the construction. Uh, Okay, so these uh, GCMS are, are constructing, as I said, based on solving a, a large elliptic Hodge system and also coupled to transport equations, as, as I should explain later on. Uh, okay, now, uh, this is uh, this fact that together with the knowledge of alpha alpha bar, so again, alpha alpha bar, remember alpha alpha bar in principle are determined by uh, from that P that I, I mentioned earlier, which comes from the Chandra Sekar transformation and which itself does not depend much on, on the gauge condition, right? So I can imagine that at least in principle, this alpha alpha bar are determined, and then uh, uh, together with this GCMS condition, I can show uh, that all other connection and curvature components are control, and by control I mean control with specific decay rates uh, for each component of, uh, of uh, curvature and connection. Okay, so this is, uh, anyway, so this is... Uh, so, just to understand this GC and this sphere again, are, are you saying here, uh, you show that there exists a, a frame, uh, in the frame of freedom of... Uh, yes. ...can arrange to have the trace of chi uh, satisfying this? Yes. Or do we have also to construct uh, how the sphere is uh, located in, in space? Yeah, so... So, th so there are two parts in the construction. So first of all, so again, I assume that I already have extended the previous space-time. The previous space-time consisted of some sigma star here, which had GCMS. But once I extend it, I don't have them anymore. Right? So now I have to construct a new one. So 
so in, in this region, I have a lot of uh, uh, control on uh, the extended, so let me call it gamma extension and, and curvature extension. So I extend the, the gammas from before in this region and R in this region. So I have a lot of control here, right? But what I don't have is GCMS. So what I show is that, uh, that uh, at every, sorry? And I have coordinates, yes. Yeah. It's essential, yeah. It's essential that I also have coordinates. So in other words, I have, so I have also coordinates here. Uh, you have to change the co yeah. So I, I'm going to change the coordinates in such a way that it will be like that. Yes, but but uh, uh, so this uh, this I should also call right. So so once I have once I have this, I also have coordinates. It's not such a big deal. But now I use everything that I have in order to construct a new GCMS. So how do I do that? I take a sphere. Uh, of the old foliation, of the foliation which has been extended, right? So this will be a sphere like that. I take its uh, south pole and I construct a new sphere, which is a GCMS. And but th this is, yeah, this is. No, 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 no. The, the, the whole sphere has to be constructed, of course, yeah. Right, exactly. No. Otherwise, the frame will be just a linear theory. But uh, non-linearly, I have to construct the whole sphere. So you, you construct the whole sphere, and then uh, you also construct a, a sigma star, which consists of GCMS. And this is your new, or new boundary. And, and then uh, you, know, you go this way, and uh, you, you show that this can continue forever. And okay. So. Uh, OK, so the, the space-time M, space-like hypersurface sigma star, and the two geodesic foliations are constructed by a continuity argument, which I already mentioned, starting with the initial data layer. right? So that's the uh, one I said. The initial data layer was constructed by, uh, in a joint work with Niccolo in 2001-2003. And then uh, you derive sufficient decay for gamma R. In other words, for the connection coefficients and curvature coefficients. And then you close back to the main wave equation for P. So the whole point about this equation is that now I have something on the right hand side, exactly in the same way as, as uh, uh, in what we discussed last time. I had to solve this system of equation by taking lead derivatives with various vector fields. So the, the when I commute, I'm going to get uh, d of li x r and delta of li x r is something which is very complicated on the right hand side because it's something which depends on the deformation tensor of x and also curvature. So, uh, so and this of course could kill you because because uh, these are some kind of system of wave equations. It's a Maxwell type system. But to the right hand side, and the right hand side can be terrible. If you don't have enough decay, if I don't have enough decay for the right hand side, I will not be able to close. The same thing happens here. Uh, if I go back to this Chandra Sekar equation, right? So uh, actually, it's a Reggie Wheeler type equation. Uh, because I'm in non linear theory, uh, this term here, which is quadratic, can be still very extremely complicated. And if I don't have enough information about gamma and r, I will not be able to close. And, uh, and therefore, uh, somehow, the essential point of the entire construction is that I have to derive sufficient <coughs> information, sufficient decay information about gamma and r, so that this uh, error term here does not create any problem for estimating p. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, est the estimates for p are connected back to estimates for gamma and r, and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is a usual kind of bootstrap. All right, now let me, let me mention at least some of the uh, main statements in the theorem. So this is a little bit more precise. So you start with initial conditions in the layer, in the boundary layer. Some norm, I'm not going to specify the norm here because it's a little, I mean, there's no point. It's, it's, uh, uh, th these norms are relatively complicated because they involve powers of r. 
but different components have different powers of r. So, uh, so I start with the initial data, which is less than some epsilon zero. Epsilon zero has to be sufficiently small in order to prove the stability. The conclusion is that there exists a future globally hyperbolic development with complete future non-infinity i plus in the future horizon, which verifies. Okay, so now I want to say something about norms in space-time. Right? So there are various type of norms. Again, I'm not going to make them uh, precise because they are uh, too technical. But you could uh, just, uh, it's maybe useful to remember that there will be norms in which I have pointwise decay for various quantities. In fact, these quantities will come here in a second. So this, this norm measure decay in various quantity. And k small refers to the fact that uh, you take only a small number of derivatives. So actually, it's important here. You have to take quite a lot of derivatives. And uh, I'm going to distinguish between small and k large. But well, this k large is much bigger than k small. So decay is only, I only need decay, very precise rates of decay for uh, a small number of derivatives. Small can still be about 50 number of derivatives. I don't, I mean the number of derivatives here is not, uh, I don't have to be very precise about how, how many I take, except to say that there are still a finite number at the end, at the end of the day. And anyway, so this, this is a quantity which, uh, which uh, measures decay of my various quantities, and this is a quantity which measures, for n large number of deri derivatives, measures the energy, and that does not have decay. It has only powers of R. So th this is a norm which has only powers of R, no decay in it, uh, in terms of weights, and uh, the whole thing has to be less than C epsilon zero. Okay, so you, you see K small is a half K large plus one. In particular, so this is now, I'm, I'm saying something about these norms. In particular, this norm tell you that the curvature alpha and beta, for example, the highest components, decay like 1 over r cubed times u plus 2 r to the 1 half, and this is a small delta, and uh, either like this or like that. So here you have more decay in u, and anyway, this is uh, somehow the rate of decay with respect to both r and u, right? So in particular, if I'm on u equal constant, the decay is just uh, r to the 7 half. This is exactly consistent to the stability of Minkowski space. That's exactly how, how we had in stability of the Minkowski space, we had exactly r to the 7 half for this component alpha and also beta. Uh, and then there are the, the component beta bar, which decays only like 1 over r squared, co component alpha bar, which is the component that goes all... The radiative component. This is the radiative component. So this is the one you see in LIGO, right? The only one you see in LIGO is this 1 over r. And then uh, there are uh, components of the, of the Ricci coefficients, the kappa hat and zeta and so on and so forth. You, 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 they all have very precise rates of decay. It's extremely important to be very precise, exactly because of the reason I mentioned, uh, I mentioned here, that you have to control this term at the end of the day. And the delta decay is strictly positive? And this is a strictly positive number which you choose, it, which, is small, which is small. You can also take it larger, actually. But we didn't, we didn't, yeah. But you can impose it because there were recently I had discussions um, about this thing that the decay in general of alpha bar will be 1 over u, not... Without the r? Without the delta, no, no, I'm speaking as a function of u. Ah, yeah. After multiplying by r, so you get... You just u, you mean. 1 over u for large u. And this is very important in four dimensions, that it's not larger not faster than 1 over u, for alpha bar, and uh, maybe also chi bar, yes. For alpha bar. So uh, here, is it something you impose, that there is 1 plus delta? Because physically, the tail effects impose that it cannot go faster than 1 over u. You mean for, for, uh, for what, for the two-body problem, or for...? Or, yeah, for solutions link, okay, but which have quadruple moments. Uh -huh. at some stage. So I wonder whether you impose this as a choice of uh, faster decay. Or anyway, it's consistent to do that. Yeah, it is, it is, it is consistent to do that, but, uh, but it will be interesting to... Well, it, it, it has something to do with, with your initial conditions. Your initial conditions are such that you can also get that. Ah, but, yes, that's true. but I'm curious about uh, yeah. what you say, so maybe we should discuss. We discuss. 
Okay, so in any case, uh, this is what you, what you have. Uh, in interior, everything decays like uh, u bar to the 1 plus delta c. So u bar, remember, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the optical function corresponding to the interior. So th this decays, they all have uniform rates of decay, which is normal in the interior. M infinity is, as we said, is defined like this, and you get that m infinity is close to m0. So in other words, you don't get too far away from the original mass. Uh, on the future horizon, you can get an asymptotics of the future horizon. R is equal to 2m infinity plus something which behaves like this. Uh, in mx, rho, rho is not, remember that rho is obviously not uh, small. Uh, it has to have a correction. This is a Th this is a Schwarzschild value of rho, so you have to take it away. So you take rho plus this is less than these quantities, and so on and so forth. So th there are all sorts of very precise. In fact, you, you have to be pre you have no choice when you do stability in general relativity. You have no choice. You have to be very very precise with all components. You have to get the correct decay both in R and in U with a lot of precision. Uh, OK, th this is now the coordinates. You asked me about the coordinates. So this is how the coordinates look like. Uh, so you can construct coordinates such that the final, the, the, the final uh, metric has this form with m infinity here. And in the interior, it has this form. Uh, you have the bond mass law formula. Uh, the bond mass, of course, is the limit of m u r as r goes to infinity. Good, but so this is uh, the standard thing that you you get. Uh, final bond mass is exactly the m infinity which we already discussed. Okay, so now uh, you know that uh, in Polish people say that it should be called the bondy Troutman or Troutman bondy. But fortunately, Christian is not here, so he would have complained. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I. I are you, do, so do you, do you do that? I mean, you call it Bondi Troutman? There was a paper of Troutman before Bondi, that's true. Okay. Doing the same thing? Essentially. Ah, okay, then it should not, be called. Not essentially, I mean, uh, it was, uh, okay. But then it should be called it Bondi. But it should, then, then it should be called Bondi Troutman. Yes, I think so. Okay, good, so yeah. I'll, I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll change. Okay, so, uh, so this is a uh, uh, formula, okay, bondy mass. Okay, so now uh, the main intermediate, intermediate steps. So the theorem number one, okay, so you have to start, so it's a long, unfortunately the construction takes a lot of space to do it, uh, but conceptually it's not too difficult. I mean, once you understand what's going on, it's not too difficult to describe. So in a first approximation, you start with the initial data, right? So I have initial data, which is less than epsilon zero. And I look at this equation, which was uh, the Chandasekhar equation, right? The, 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 which is, I, I call it Q-frac here, but it was before called P, right? So P and Q-frac are the same thing. So I call it Q-frac because in, 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 in the polarized case, this uh, P, which is actually a two tensor, reduces to something simple, OK? So, uh, so you show that uh, solutions of this equation verify uh, this norm, which uh, th this is a norm which involves everything, including decay, the decay rates for Q-frac, is less than epsilon 0. So again, th this type of norms, I, I don't go to write it specifically, but it's something that has to do with this kind of, uh, this kind of behavior, right? Which I, I think I, I don't have to say much more right now. And here uh, you have suddenly plus 20 derivatives. And it, it, right, and you, you have, because you have to do the bootstrap. Okay, so, sorry, I didn't mention the bootstrap. So you, 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 you make a bootstrap assumption about uh, about, uh, so the bootstrap assumption, let me write it here. So the bootstrap assumption The 
discipline you lose derivative that you need to start with many? Uh, right. So, so I make a bootstrap assumption. With a, so you see, you, you have a epsilon 0, which corresponds to initial data. Right? So th this is something that I can make small. Right? And then I have a bootstrap assumption, which is an epsilon, which is going to be larger than this, typically. Right? Uh, and also, I have, uh, I have k small and k large. So the bootstrap assumption has to do with k small and k large. Right, so for example, these decay norms are only for k small, right? Okay, so now, however, when I, uh, and then there is another one here. So this, these are decay norms, and these are energy norms. So energy type norms, right, which are bounded in terms of uh, this parameter epsilon. All right, so what I have to do now, you see, when I, when I look at this equation, it's an equation with error terms on the right-hand side. So in principle, uh, these error terms will look like epsilon squared times some decay rates, which are very important in order to close to, to be able to estimate this Q, in other words, to get this type of estimate. So, uh, so you get automatically epsilon 0 because epsilon square is, is, I can always make it to be strictly less than epsilon 0. And therefore, somehow I beat, I beat the, the bootstrap uh, constant. But at the same time, I lose a certain number of derivatives. In other words, uh, sorry, I, I gain, uh, excuse me. So I gain derivatives because originally I had uh, I had the bootstrap assumption for k small, and now I get actually k small plus 20. The reason I want to do that is because in the process, I keep losing derivatives. So I, I want to, b at the end of the day, I want to get back to exactly k small, right? In other words, I, I want to beat the bootstrap assumption. I want to show that the bootstrap assumption is not only verified, it's, it's you, you, make a, you, you made an assumption, but at the end, you get something even better. And the norms are regularly weighted sobol f, no? Yes. They are uh, weighted, yeah, they are weighted in R, weighted in R. Squares of uh, derivatives. Correct, yeah, exactly. And, uh, uh, okay, so, the, so you see, you, you, that's why I, you want to get a little bit more in case small because you are going to keep losing. So this is, in the first approximation, what you show is that Q frac is, has a good estimate in terms of epsilon zero, which is your, your good parameter because this is, uh, this is what you control in terms of the initial data. So this you, all right. Now, theorem number, uh, the, the next two theorems is to show that once I have Q frac, I also have alpha, alpha bar. So this is what I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, alpha goes into that P. And if I know P, I can go back and get estimates for alpha. Here you lose five derivatives. And I lose, I lose a certain number of derivatives when I do that, yeah. Because, I, Right, and, but nevertheless, I'm still larger than k small plus 15. Uh, and then I go, uh, okay, so this is now the hard part, because here I have to use uh, the GCM's constructions to get from, uh, from these estimates for alpha, alpha bar, to get the estimates for all Ricci and curvature components. Mm -hmm. Right, and to show that these are still within epsilon zero, you, you lose another 10 derivatives. But in the end, you get k small plus 5 is less than epsilon 0, while the, while the bootstrap assumption had k small less than epsilon. So you obviously have improved the bootstrap assumption at this stage. And then, uh, uh, then you have to do something about, uh, about this other norm. So this is uh, the norm that, has, that uh, uh, involves the energy. Okay, I didn't say much about this, and I'm not going to say, but uh, you have to do something more. Okay, and then finally, you have to extend the space-time. So you see, up to now, all these theorems concern uh, the space-time, uh, which I call the bootstrap space-time, the one that ends in sigma star, and uh, it, it, the sigma star consists in G GCMS, in, in, uh, in the, the, this type of conditions, which I, I said are extremely important. So with those conditions, I'm able to derive all these estimates, which are improved estimates, they are better than the bootstrap. And now, since they are better than the bootstrap, it means I can go further. 
uh, right? So the, that's, uh, these are the, the theorem 7 and 8, which says that, uh, uh, but first of all, you define u in R plus to be the set of value of u star such that an admissible spacetime exists for u up to u star, verifying BA. Admissible spacetime is a spacetime that, that satisfies all the assumptions, bootstrap assumption plus the fact that sigma star consists in GCMS. Right? That's exactly what I mean by admissible. Admissible is a spacetime which ends in sigma star, which consists of GCMS and which verifies all the bootstrap assumptions. So, uh, so, so then uh, I look at the maximum value of u star for which such a thing exists, which verifies these things. I use, uh, and in theorem 7, because of the previous six theorems, and because I have improved the bootstrap uh, assumption, I can show that there exists a delta 0, which allows me to go a little bit further. And then uh, once I go a little bit further, I show that, in fact, I can go for all time because otherwise I reach a contradiction. So that's basically uh, the idea. All right, so here is a construction of GCMS. Let me go very fast over this because I think this is, a, in a sense, conceptually, this is the most interesting new part. So as I said, uh, assume that you have a metric in your space-time, which looks like this, and assume that you have control on these coefficients. I have control on this, control on this, control on this, right? So that's very important. That I have control. The control comes from the fact that when I extend my space-time, uh, right, uh, after in theorem 7, when I do the extension, I do the extension and I show that I still control all the uh, metric coefficients and all the Ricci coefficients. Okay, so then uh, I look at all the possible frame transformations. And now I have to be more careful. I have to look at the full set uh, of transformation. Actually, I put here lower the terms, but even these lower the terms are important, in fact. So uh, a general transformation looks like this. So with given f, f bar, and a, which are all of epsilon, I get uh, uh, the general transformation is of this type. All right, so now here is what I want to do. I, I want to, I start with an S0, right, which is uh, a surface corresponding to this foliation. So th there is a foliation by U and S. So for every U and S fixed, there is a, a specific surface. So I start with that surface, and I want to make a deformation of it that goes from a 0 to S. Right? And here I'm going to use polarization, because uh, the construction in general, we haven't done it. I mean, here we actually have used polarization. So polarization means that every deformation can be described in terms of function u and function s, which depend on theta, on the parameter theta. So it, they don't depend on phi, in other words, phi, because of the polarization. So, uh, so then uh, uh, I, I have to construct u and s, and the frame here, so, I, so I have to, what I have to do is to find a frame f, f bar, and a corresponding to s, and the capital U and capital S, such that my conditions, the condition I want, the GCMS conditions, are verified on s. Okay, so proposition given a zero. Okay, here, here is actually a slightly different version of uh, this GCMS, but it doesn't really matter. The idea is exactly the same. So here I assume that I have an S0 close to uh, a small value of R. So R, R0 is like 2M0 plus 1 plus delta H. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to go from the frame E3, 4, and E theta. I go to a new frame, which is a frame adapted. Right. So the important thing is that, that uh, I have an S0, I have a deformation. But on this deformation, I, 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 I want to have a frame, which is E3s, E4s, E theta s, right? While originally I had E3, E4, E theta. So at every point on this deformation, I have the old frame. And I'm, I'm trying to go from the old frame to a new frame. But this frame should be adapted to s. In other words, the E theta should be tangent to s. So this, this two should be transversal, and E theta should be tangent. So I have, to, uh, I have to make sure that, uh, that uh, my construction uh, takes into account this. And also I want to have some GCMS condition. Again, it doesn't quite matter which conditions you choose. The important thing is that I have three conditions. I have here ka kappa s is 2 over r s, and these ones are 0, for example. Right? And then uh, I define this adaptive null transformation, which means that 
that uh, the psi takes uh, the original e theta and to e theta of s, which is tangent to my surface. This leads to, uh, so, uh, so this is a compatibility condition that uh, I have to write down. So I'm not going to, to write it down here because these equations are rather complicated. But in any case, you, everything can be expressed uh, in terms of equations which tie u and s to f, f bar and a. Right? So there will, there's a system of equations that, that tie u and s to a, a, f, and f bar, which are kind of transport type equations. Right? And then the equations on a, f, and f bar, so these are the main things. These equations, in addition, are tied to the GCMS conditions. And the GCMS conditions give you an elliptic system. In other words, I, I should write it here. So you have. Uh, So schematically, things look like this. You have an S0. You have, a, you have this deformed surface F. You have U and S. And here you have uh, F, F bar, and A, which solve an elliptic system, F, F bar, A. It's an elliptic system, let's say, a complicated elliptic system on S. Right? So this, at every point on S, these are defined. And th this corresponds to the transformation that goes from, so at every point here, right, so this is a two surface, at every point I have the old frame and the new frame. So the new frame is given by this, is obtained from the old frame by this. So I, the, the GCMS condition becomes just this. And in addition, there are equations that, that are of the type, uh, say, U prime uh, is connected with, uh, with F and F bar by some complicated equation. And the same thing S prime is connected by this by a complicated equation. So these are some kind of transport equations. So it's a system. What I have to solve, I have to find US and AF and F bar, which verify a coupled system between transport equations, which relate U and S to F and F bar, and this elliptic system. Right? So th this is uh, what you have to do. So this leads to an iteration where uh, you, you see, you have at every point, you have to iterate like this. At every point, you have un, sn, an, fn, and f bar n, starting with a trivial q0. Q, the trivial q0 is just a trivial deformation of s0 to s0. And, uh, and then uh, uh, un, sn defines a map. So, see, this is what's complicated because for every iter iterate, you define a map from s0 to a surface sn. Right? So this is some deformation. And on it, I define now this elliptic system, which is this one. Right? So on Sn, I define An plus 1, Fn plus 1, F bar N plus 1 to, to verify this elliptic system, where D is some kind of uh, Hodge system corresponding to this surface. And then I construct a new pair. So, <coughs> so th th this is a way to define the new at every point. Uh, in my iteration, I define, a, given that this is already known, I define an plus 1, fn plus 1, f bar n plus 1 by solving this, this type of Hodge system. And once I have these things, I find un plus 1, sn plus 1 by solving a transport equation. So of course what's difficult is that, is that you, the sphere here at type n is different from the sphere at time n plus 1, right? So I have, I'm going to have a 0, I have an sn here, and I have an sn plus 1 here. And I, somehow I have to compare these two surfaces. And of course, the, the only way to compare them is to take the pull back to a 0 and compare the, the corresponding metrics on a 0 and so on and so forth. So it's a complicated procedure, but, but uh, uh, it's conceptually pretty clear what you have to do. And so this is a contractual argument and so on and so forth. So I think this is probably a good, a good place to stop. And is it important that you are close to 2n? Because at some points, they appear the condition that you were close to 2n. Yeah, no. So, so this is a simplified version, which is close to 2n. But I, in, in what I described, actually, it happens uh, far away. OK. Yeah. So, so I always say powers of r will be important, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. It's true, yeah. But you know, 
I wonder, I mean, this cannot be too different for some of the things that you have to do, right, in terms of the center of mass frame. I mean, the, the fact that the center... So basically, we take into account that the center of mass frame changes, right, with, uh, with uh, dynamics. Right? Well, uh, where is the condition that you are mass center, that you have no dipole? Well, it's exactly, it's, it's exactly this GCMS, right? The GCMS conditions are exactly that. Right. That's exactly where uh, you, you say that you are centered. Because essentially some quantities are, are uniform without a dipole component that would be a displacement right. of the center of mass, just to understand. Right. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> right, I mean obviously you have to, in your calculations you have to do that too, of course. At every point in the, right, when... Ah, it would be, would be good to talk about, to yes. see, to see, uh, Because in general, when you have a system which is radiating with a source with bodies, uh, uh, the thing is going to recoil. I mean, you emit gravitational waves, and there are more gravitational waves, momentum emitted in one direction. So at the end, uh, your source is moving in one direction, and the gravitational waves compensates for the this. So we do not keep the center of mass uh, fixed in the gauge. Of course, yeah. Yeah, which is... But here you keep it, you adapt your... Oh. We don't, uh, we are not in a center of mass frame for the, for the source, okay? If you are to describe... The, the central part of the space, I must say. But here maybe you don't radiate uh, angu uh, linear momentum because of the polarization property. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah, so that would be, the, the, that's going to be more difficult, but it would be nice to talk to you about this. Okay.